Okay. Hi, Joe. Uh, Hi. So, can you tell me about uh, more about Safe Cast and what you're doing up uh, in Japan? In Japan, yeah. Safe Cast is measuring uh, environmental uh, factors worldwide. In Japan, we're concentrating on radiation measurements because that's what everybody's concerned about this year. And for the radi radiation measurements that you've got in uh, around Japan so far. Uh, what are the numbers like? We have literally millions of measurements. Almost all of them are uh, quite low or really would be typical around the world about uh, between 0 0.08 to uh, 0.2 microsieverts per hour in most of Japan. Only up uh, up north around uh, Fukushima in Koryama, Nihonmatsu is it higher. There's some areas in uh, northern Chiba around Kashiwa and things that are uh, 0.3, even 0.4 microsieverts per hour. But you have to go up into Fukushima to find the levels that are 2, 3, even you know 5 microsieverts per hour. And of course, uh, inside the, the exclusion zone and some of the evacuated areas to the northwest of the, the nuclear power plant, then there's areas that are 12, uh, even the highest we've measured is 50 uh, microsieverts per hour. But that was very close to the plant. What about in the areas that are damaged? Sendai is quite close to Fukushima. What is the highest that you have you measured around Sendai? This, this is something that uh, I find to be quite a common misconception in that uh, Japan suffered a, you know, a kind of triple uh, disaster with the earthquake, the tsunami, and the radiation release. But by and large, they don't overlap a lot. Uh, the earthquake damage is really quite minimal. The tsunami damage is very devastating and clearly the largest uh, effect. And then the, the radiation contaminated areas are are pretty much separate. If you go to Koryama and Nihonmatsu, there's almost no earthquake damage, absolutely no uh, tsunami damage, and they've got the bulk of the radioactive contamination. In Sendai, uh, Minimi Sanriku, uh, Ishinomaki, they've got just horrendous tsunami damage and no radiation contamination whatsoever. So in, in terms of uh, radiation, I think there is a common uh, idea that it's quite in Japan, there is like a lot of radiation, especially what about in the seas and fishes? Uh... Well, we the best estimates. I mean, obviously, nobody was monitoring, so they're using models, and, and and I've been reading about predictions. And from what we can tell from wind and the the, the weather at the time, clearly seventy five to eighty percent of the of the radioactive materials that came out of the the Daiichi plant went out to sea. So they either fell on the ocean or went out in the effluents in the water that flowed into the ocean. So, yes, the largest amount of, of radioactive materials or contaminants went into the ocean. But the ocean is, uh, is full of water, and the water mixes it around and dilutes things enormously. So there is quite a bit of concern, both because we don't know what it all went out there and, and how concentrated it is or where it is. But we have recently uh, gotten some measurements that were shared with us from, uh, from Greenpeace. They've tested... Uh, quite a few food fishes that are available in the market. And I was surprised to find that the, even having tested such a wide variety of sea life, they found levels that were quite low, even lower than the very strict standards that are expected to be adopted uh, soon. Uh, the most contaminated uh, thing they found was a, uh, a fish uh, that was 88 uh, becquerels per kilogram. Almost all of the things they tested were either no detectable amounts of uh, cesium-134 and cesium-137, or less than 20 uh, becquerels per kilogram. So actually quite a bit lower than I expected from uh, sea life numbers. So what, in, in terms of radiation, uh, for the kind of really dangerous isotopes like iodine, like... The really dangerous isotopes, there's a couple reasons that we worry some more about some isotopes. Mm -hmm. um, iodine-131 is especially uh, worrisome because it's very active, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a chemical that the body needs as a nutrient. So whenever we encounter it in an environment, our body tends to scavenge it and sequester it in our, especially in our thyroid, and that's, you know, dangerous because we're actually keeping it in our body. However, iodine-131 is also used in medical procedures, deliberately given to, to some people, because it has a very short half-life. So its effect, uh, it, the isotope decays away very quickly. With a half-life of only eight days, all of the iodine-131 that was released is now gone from the environment. We've detected no iodine-131 anywhere in Japan f since uh, late April of last year. Uh, strontium-90 is also a, an isotope of great concern. 
partially because uh, it's also one that has a bioaffinity. Our bodies want to uh, take it in, they use it in place of calcium, so it winds up being concentrated in our bones. Uh, and also, it's a very strong beta emitter. Uh, the fact that it's a beta emitter makes it very difficult for us to detect because we normally find things with uh, uh, gamma detectors. Uh, even when we do find the beta uh, emissions with a Geiger counter, we can't tell what it is because we find it with a Geiger counter, we try to use a gamma spectrometer to identify the isotope, and of course, strontium-90 doesn't show up. So it's very difficult to, to find out if it's out there, and it was of great concern for many months after the incident. But over last summer, you know, in a combination of collecting samples and sending them to laboratories, we've been quite relieved to find out that the, uh, the strontium-90 component of the emissions was less than half a percent compared to the cesium. So, uh, some places we've detected, even in chemical and laboratory tests, no strontium-90 in very highly concentrated samples where the, uh, the cesium was in the 30 to 100,000 becquerels per kilogram. The uh, strontium-90 was much lower than that, 190, maybe 200 becquerels per kilogram, so much less than half a percent. So since we've had enough samples of those combinations, we're very confident that the strontium-90 contamination across Japan is quite low compared to the cesium. Uh, obviously, any strontium-90 in the environment is, is not a good thing to have, but it's so overwhelmed by the cesium contamination that that's the thing to really look for. Cesium is also a very reactive chemical, and uh, 134 is a very active isotope of it. Cesium-137 is a medium-active, but very, or medium-long-lived half-life. Uh, with a 30-year half-life, it's going to be around for a while. Uh, it's also treated by our bodies about like calcium, so it winds not sorry, not like calcium, like uh, potassium. So it winds up being uh, collected in our muscles, but we don't keep it very long. The biological half-life of uh, cesium in the body is 30 to 90 days, depending on your metabolism and your your age. So uh, if it's in the food, then it gets in our bodies, and it takes a while to flush out. It's also a strong beta emitter and a gamma emitter, uh, and it's by far the largest contamination covering Japan right now. So, compared to maybe Chernobyl or mm -hmm. any, is is there anything that was like previously in Chernobyl that was like really scary and any lessons that we learn and that scare us? There's a lot of uh, lessons that were learned from the, the Chernobyl incident. Um, one of the, di the big differences is that with Chernobyl, we didn't, you know, as a, as a scientific community and as a, as a populace, didn't know a lot about Chernobyl early on. And it was, the studies are years in getting started and now, you know, decades in, uh, in, it, in progress. So some things we know from Chernobyl that helped us quite a bit. Uh, the, the way that cesium-137 uh, moves in the environment, most of our understanding of that is, comes from Chernobyl studies. Uh, the, one of the primary differences was the mixture of isotopes. Okay, the, the Chernobyl reactor was a very different kind of incident, and it threw uh, large amounts of cesium-134, 137, uh, same as Fukushima, but much more iodine-131 and strontium-90 comparatively. As far as we know, it's difficult to know exactly because those short, the short-lived isotopes like iodine were gone before anybody started looking carefully at Chernobyl. Uh, one of the things we do tend to uh, take a bit of trust in is that the, the environmental mobility of cesium-137 uh, around Chernobyl, how it moves through the ground, how it moves from plant to plant or blows in the air, we're pretty sure those models will be appropriate for J Japan also, but we won't know for sure for, and for a couple of years. Uh, if you look at samples from uh, Chernobyl now, it's easy to see the cesium-137 because after 25 years, there's still more than half of it remaining. But the cesium-134 is mostly gone. So uh, soil samples from Chernobyl and soil samples from Fukushima, which we've compared in laboratories here, it's very easy to identify them by the ratio of cesium-134 to cesium-137. So in, in terms of health hazards, like what has Chernobyl created and like what are the steps that, if you were there then, what are the steps that you would do to just prevent some of these things from happening? Uh, prevent some of the... Uh, I'm sorry, please elaborate. So, I mean, uh, when in Chernobyl, mm -hmm. it, there are you know, a lot of horror stories about mutated children and, and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, Is there anything they could take to prevent things from happening or just stay away from the... the it's the impossible to stay away from radiation. Okay, there's, uh, radiation exists in the environment but you from natural sources, from man-made sources, uh, from things like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, 
there, I don't think it's practical to just try and avoid going outside or, or avoid eating. I mean, we're going to have to we have to deal with it a different way. One of the things that came out of the 